Beelden vanuit een klas uh, van een leerkracht uh, van zesde leerjaar, uh, een basisschool in, in Gent, een Salvatorschool, uh, die ook deelnam aan het project Thuistaal. Als ik me goed herinner, ook kwalitatief project, uh, Piet, denk ik. Uh, ja. En uh, die leerkracht was uh, in het begin helemaal totaal tegen het uh, invoeren van Thuistaal uh, uh, binnen de school. En uh, aan de beelden zie je het eigenlijk wel hoe dat veranderd is en hoe dat hij er naar kijkt. Ja, kom, we gaan naar de rij. Ga maar vlug naar de rij. Op de speerplaats, dat was het meest stresterende kwartiertje dat er was. Want wat deed je? Je was eigenlijk Sherlock Holmes. Je liep overal rond om te iemand die niet Nederlands sprak, de betrappen die vlogen langs de kant, werden gestraft. En toen dacht je eigenlijk, ja. We zijn hier constant bezig aan het bestraffen. Dus we waren vooral aan het focussen op dat alleen maar Nederlands spreken. Acht jaar geleden werd het voorstel op school gebracht van we gaan de thuistaal toelaten. En ik moet zeggen, ik had daar heel wat bezwaren tegen. Wie heeft er nog allemaal familie wonen die niet in België woont? Wie woont? Semig? Uw oma, waar woont die? Turkije. Eileen? Ook uw oma, waar woont die? In Pakistan? Mijn grootste angst was dat ze geen Nederlands meer gingen praten. Dat ze alleen maar hun eigen thuistaal gingen praten. En dan dacht je van eigenlijk gaan die leerlingen constant tegen elkaar bezig zijn. En ik ga als leerkracht daar als vijfde wiel van de wagen bij staan. Ik weet niet wat er gezegd wordt. Over wat zijn ze aan het spreken tegen mij? Is het over mij dat ze bezig zijn? Is het over iemand anders? Het controlerende dat we hadden bij het Nederlands, waar we zogezegd een stukje kwijt. Ja, we gaan vandaag werken aan onze remediering van onze toets. Belangrijk is dat je werkt aan de tafels. Jullie gaan, Ertegruul, jij gaat Gorzang helpen als buddy bij de toets. En jullie twee, Eileen en Boersin, jullie gaan Melis helpen. Je kan niet verwachten van iemand die hier pas toekomt. Meestal uit een oorlogssituatie of uit een vluchtsituatie. Om onmiddellijk te zeggen van je gaat hier binnen de twee dagen perfect Nederlands kunnen. Vandaar dat ik meestal het gebruik maak, als het mogelijk is in de klas, van een buddy met dezelfde thuistaal. Die overschakelt naar de thuistaal, dingen in het Nederlands uitlegt in de thuistaal. En dat ze elkaar zo helpen. Melis is nog maar een half jaar op school. Ze krijgt hulp van haar buddies, twee Bulgaarse klasgenoten, Aileen en Bursin. Als zij iets niet snapt, wij, um, wij kunnen haar, haar helpen. In het begin was bij haar moeilijk en nu, nu nog een beetje beter. We merken dat dat aandeel in het begin zeer groot is. Dat de thuistaal 80, 90 procent van de, de tijd inneemt, 10 procent in, in, in het Nederlands. Maar dat dan na een tijdje drie, vier weken verandert naar de naaf de naaf. En je hebt heel wat leerlingen, en ik heb dat in al die jaren nu al duidelijk gemerkt, leerlingen die zo na twee of drie maanden zeggen ja, maar doe maar in het Nederlands hoor, ik kan nu voldoende Nederlands. Ik zie dat jullie zeer goed bezig zijn. Ik kan je haar eens uitleggen dat het zeer belangrijk is van alle cijfertjes mooi netjes onder elkaar te schrijven bij het cijfer. Ja, uh, die uh, beelden werden ook getoond uh, van het tv-programma Koppen in mei 2016, denk ik. Uh, nu komt er een uh, uitvoering van functioneel meertalig leren, hoe dat het eigenlijk wel in de klas uh, een vorm kan krijgen. Uh, Onderwijscentrum Gent heeft vorig jaar uh, via een project uh, gewerkt aan een tool, uh, functioneel meertalig leren voor leerkrachten van uh, secundair onderwijs, via een netwerk uh, van een aantal uh, scholen uh, in Gent. En om, om die tool een, een body te geven en te laten a, uh, afstemmen met de uh, realiteit van de leerkrachten in de klaspraktijk, hebben we een aantal leerkrachten uh, interviews uh, opgenomen en een video gemaakt. Het video is nog niet volledig. 
als je geen rekening houdt met het thuisstel van de leerlingen, dan houd je eigenlijk geen rekening met een stuk van hun identiteit. Dus zij brengen heel veel bagage mee en wie ze zijn, welke taal ze thuis spreken. En daar zit ook heel veel belangrijke kennis die ze kunnen inzetten om het Nederlands machtiger te worden. De thuisstel is de taal waar onze leerlingen zich over het algemeen het meest comfortabel bij voelen. Dus de hun thuistaal betrekken bij het lesgebeuren kan ervoor zorgen dat ze een iets meer zelfvertrouwen hebben en iets meer spreekdurf tonen, ook voor de opdrachten in het Nederlands. Ik vind het interessant om dat als meerwaarde te zien, zowel voor de leerlingen als voor de leerkracht. Eh, omdat het motiverend werkt, omdat het gemakkelijker is om bepaalde doelstellingen te bereiken. Ik heb uh, uit ervaring ondervonden dat het niet altijd heel eenvoudig is om de leerlingen in het Nederlands iets uit te leggen. Vandaar dat ik een beetje ben teruggevallen dan op de thuistaal. Eerst heb ik dat geprobeerd met visueel materiaal en dan ben ik begonnen met de leerlingen zelf dingen aan elkaar te laten uitleggen. Dat is een beetje een groeiproces geweest, want in het begin is het van ik moet loslaten. Zorg ervoor dat je de talige achtergrond van de leerlingen goed kent, zodat je die heel specifiek kan inzetten tijdens de lessen en ook je opdrachten eraan kan aanpassen. Als je aan de slag gaat met de thuistaal van de leerlingen, maak dan duidelijk afspraken met de leerlingen wanneer die thuistaal wel en wanneer die niet kan ingezet worden, zodanig dat dat echt wel functioneel is. Zie functioneel meertalig leren niet als iets wat er weer zou bovenop komen en boven al het andere werk, maar ga echt gaan kijken in je handboek, in je lesmateriaal, van waar zou ik op een of andere manier dat functioneel meertalig leren kunnen inpassen. Je kan er altijd zelf mee experimenteren. Je hebt het zelf in hand, je laat het zoveel toe zoals je zelf wil. Dus jij hebt er de controle over, dus probeer het uit. How um, do we cope with that multilingualism in the classroom? All those theories, they're all very nice and pretty, but how do we transfer that to the classroom? And the first statement is to, to achieve SG SDG4, which is um, that quality education should be uh, attainable for everyone. Um, so to achieve that goal, attention for multilingualism in education is key. Therefore, every teacher should be able to apply language-oriented subject education, taalgericht vak onderwijs voor wie uh, de Engelse term niet kent, um, in order to deepen the learner's prior linguistic knowledge as well as the development of the language skills in the new language. I turn to my panel. Who wants to start with this statement? There is a microphone for each of you, so... Oké, okay, Piet van Avermaat. I'll, you're the closest to me, so you can be my uh, Chinese volunteer. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I, I, I can only repeat what I said in my in my talk. That absolutely, that um, I, I think that is important. Um, and and this is of course nothing new. Uh, the idea of every teacher is a language teacher. I think the what what is important is the way we implement it in in our school systems, and that we um, uh, that we have the 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 adequate support systems. Um, because what I often see with non non language subject teachers is when you say. Uh, everybody should or could be uh, a language teacher is yeah but I'm not professionalized to deal with um, 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 past tense or I'm not specialized uh, with regard to, to the DT regel. I'll explain you the DT regel later <laughs> <laughs> if you have a whole life <laughs> <coughs> but um, so I think it is very important that we make clear how um, every subject teacher can play that role of uh, um, a, a language-oriented uh, teacher. Um, and we, may, we have to visualize that, we have to support th these teachers, we have to, as I said, we have to give them that feeling of efficacy, um, what that means, uh, what, how their role looks like. But I think it is uh, absolutely uh, in, in because these these teachers use language and different language repertoires and can use these the different language repertoires um, to, to deconstruct knowledge knowledge when I'm a maths teacher and and I, I, I have to teach about uh, Pythagoras theorem um, I use language so yes uh, a maths teacher can be a language teacher Okay, so what I hear you saying here is that every teacher should be aware of how he, he or she uses languages. Um, I think that teacher education, 
teacher education is going to play a major, major role in that. Um, but Minister Kertz, um, how do you think policy can affect that? Because, of course, there is a difference between what policy can decide and what uh, the work field can do. Um, mm -hmm. How do you see that happening in Brussels? Because Brussels, of course, is also a very interesting setting. Well, as you know, in theory, a policy can affect almost everything. Yeah? That is a matter of vision and of political will. And um, I think that uh, not being the Minister of Education in Brussels coping with um, um, a two-speed um, educational system, Flemish and French speaking, as you, always know, as you all know, uh, I think one of the elements that I would uh, uh, try to um, make um, a normal element of our policy is to create um, a certain, uh, not only awareness, but also uh, uh, support for uh, Brussels teacher, teachers, uh, uh, plural, to, to be able to, to do this. I give you an example of, of how practical this can become, uh, because uh, I, heard, I heard from um, Pete uh, that we are not into Kumbaya multilingualism. I'm just uh, totally, uh, I totally agree with that. Eh? We have to be, at a certain extent, very practical. Uh, we have the Onderwijs Centrum in Brussels, who is a, is a support organization for the Dutch-speaking um, schools in Brussels. 100 people for all these schools. This is quite a lot of uh, people who, who do a good, very good job. But the, um, at the French-speaking side, this doesn't exist at all. Huh? So what are we going to do? Are we going to stretch the on the west and Brussels to do everything for the French-speaking uh, teachers too? It's, I think it's a bit difficult, also on a political level. But we have to create an interface between the, the Dutch-speaking and the French-speaking system, whether it be with agreement of the, um, the two communities, we will have this dialogue and we will see if this is possible. You always have to create a dialogue, always. Eh? If people say no, they say no. That's a democratic right to do so. Eh? But we will have the dialogue. If this is difficult, but there is an opening, eh? because in the Flemish uh, um, government uh, agreement, there is um, uh, or the government declaration, there is uh, a mentioning of um, exchange of uh, language teachers, so that's interesting. There is something we can grasp and say, ah, ah it's there, you have to do something with it. <laughs> but even if it doesn't, yeah, that's how politics also work. Huh? Uh, if it, it doesn't work between the, the big brothers, the Flemish and the French-speaking community, I think with the um, French-speaking colleague, which, which is uh, Rudy Vervoort, the Minister-President of the Capital Region, is in charge of the French-speaking schools and I'm in charge of the Dutch-speaking schools. We have to create this kind of interface and awareness and support one way or the other. Eh? Because, for instance, and then I, 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 I leave it to that, uh, with immersion, the, the French-speaking colleagues have much more experience than we do, but we have a better support for... Um, also an approach of multilingualism. Yeah? And so we can exchange these things, and we will and we should. Okay, so I think that Brussels is going to be a very interesting area to look at. But it will take some time. It will take some time, okay. <laughs> Duly noted. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Kathleen, um, I think that as an outsider, um, hearing all these things, um, how do you look at it? And, and from your experience, what would you um, suggest? Normally the microphone is on. Yeah, it's on. I think it's on. Hello. It's on. <laughs> You're good. Um, so when it comes to the statement and when it comes to the information that you've heard so far, um, what, as an outsider, what kind of perspective or advice could you give us? Because I think that with uh, your experience from <laughs> South Africa and Australia, yeah. we can always learn. Um, the one thing that I want to just say is that I think that we shouldn't be thinking that academics are different from people in the classroom at the coalface because um, I see myself as a classroom teacher, so I'm in classrooms every week um, with the little children and bigger children. So I work from the little kids through all the way through to PhD students. I'm a teacher, basically, and my happiest time is in the classroom, working with children and the teachers simultaneously. So the, the thing, the, the really important thing is to, to be in classrooms. So if you've got ideas, is to get into the classrooms and to actually work with the teachers and children. So I'll just give you an example that 
Um, I'm currently working in a Chinese-English bilingual school. I can't speak Chinese. The children in the school come from all sorts of different language backgrounds. They happen to know that I come from Africa. So I go into a class where they are translanguaging between Chinese and English, but the children come from Kenya. They come from various parts of Indonesia, Africa, um, uh, all, all over the place. And every time I go into the class, and the children have want to, they want me to tell them something in Sikosa or in Afrikaans. And then they tell me things in their languages. They, the children initiate things. It's about listening to the children. That's number one. Um, and I also opened today saying that I think that the most important thing for teachers and for teacher educators and for education officials is to use common sense not to think about all the problems. What makes sense in a particular school? What makes sense in a particular classroom? What makes sense in one classroom might not be exactly the same as it does in another classroom because you have different children in different classrooms. They come from different places. The most important thing, one of the most important things is to recognize that there is not one single bullet answer that will address everything. It's how you actually understand what's happening. Now, elsewhere, we have done things like develop teacher education programs specialising in multilingual education. We've also developed <coughs> a, what is called a trainer, training of trainers programs, which actually address teacher educators and also education officials. All of those things can be put in place. But the bottom line is where there is a will, there is a way. In South Africa, we have an Afrikaans saying, a boer mark a plan. <laughs> I don't know whether that is, makes any sense here, yeah, but basically, good. does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. A boer mark a plan. Elke onavesa mark a plan. Okay. So um, basically, you make a plan. You work with what what is there. So I, I think that sometimes we think there are problems where we don't need to have problems. Um, You've got a curriculum. Everyone has got to teach with a curriculum. There's no harm in always saying, well, um, I wonder if anybody else has got a, another word for this. Anybody got another word for this? Maybe we'll put it on the board if you're doing an exercise. Maybe you, you label your little map in where, if it's grade one um, in Dutch. Um, well, some of you also speak French at home, so can you also give the French name for this? Oh, some of you might, somebody comes from um, a DRC, you might have Lingala. Can you think of a word for Lingala? Maybe you can ask your mum or dad to help you. Somebody comes from Pakistan, maybe tomorrow you can come with a word. And it doesn't matter whether it is history, geography, art, music, language, mathematics. It's very easy. I think that that has also answered somewhat one of the questions that was sent in. I'm not looking at my phone, I'm looking at, well, I am looking at my phone, but I'm just looking at the app. Um, <laughs> because one of the questions was, what can you do as an individual teacher when the government or your school policy makers are not supportive? I think that what you already said here is an example, because what you basically do is you use the previous knowledge of, your chil of the children that you have, and that knowledge <laughs> is not limited to Dutch. Um, quickly, Minister uh, Yes, I want to give an answer to that. And I think the cities can give an answer to that uh, because we are not responsible, not in Brussels, not in Ghent, not in other cities, for the, the, the programs of education as such. But we are confronted with another demographic reality. And it is not uh, a bad one, as uh, everyone wants to, or other, other, other ones wants to, want to make us believe that. And, um, well, if the, 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 there is a lacking because it doesn't happen or some some of some don't want it to happen of a, an official support uh, by the, the ministry of education whatsoever huh? um, we have to do it ourselves we have to make a plan huh? and these plans will not be perfect but there is uh, in a, enough um, knowledge and, and also possible support within the like in ghent uh, and, and in brussels to make things happen, not to uh, uh, change, uh, therefore, um, every life of every teacher radically, eh, because change is something that is important for our lives, and it has to uh, come. It has to happen every day, and then again, 
it's not a revolution every day. So we have to find, we have to give this, uh, we have to root this change into how we uh, we, we work. And I think if if there is a, a vacuum or um, by the central ministry in, in education, um, well, cities can can show the way, and and we will. Okay. Um. There's only a limited amount of time. I think that on every statement that we have, we can go on for hours and hours, but we're not going to do that. What we're going to do now is um, look at what the audience think. And you've got two cards, a green card and a red card. And the question is simple. Namely, do you agree with the statement yes or no? Um, red, obviously, is no, I do not agree. And green is yes, I do agree. Um, so put up your cards and let us see how you feel about the statement. Do you think every teacher should be able to apply a language-oriented subject uh, education? Doesn't mean that you're a language teacher, but it means that you're aware of how to stimulate language development. Yes. <laughs> but the thing is, I get, I get the response. Yes, of course we're all saying yes here. But it is important to know that, because it's possible that in your school, this is not the case. It's possible that you're on your own, that you feel that you're on your own. But no, you're not. And it's every little pebble that you can you know, move, it's going to change the river slowly. So know that you're not alone in this statement. There are many of you who feel that way. It's just step by step, little by little. Um, and hopefully, um, when we get to the next statement, um, we're, uh, we um, are able to achieve a uh, another consensus because we're first going to watch the movie, I suppose, or is it? It's a, s a short presentation. It's a short on presentation. The, the policy of oh, the yeah, city right. of Ghent. So, because now we're going to go to the interaction between policy and work field. And Ice is going to give a short presentation on the language policy of Ghent. Een uh, op twee kinderen in Ghent heeft een migratieachtergrond. Uh, uh, het aandeel van kinderen uh, in de Gentse scholen uh, zie je hier. En als we kijken naar secu uh, secundair onderwijs, zien we vooral hoge cijfers bij beroepssecundair onderwijs en deeltijds beroepssecundair onderwijs. Uh, Stad Gent heeft een sta uh, stadsbrede werkgroep taalbeleid. Alle stadsdiensten uh, van Stad Gent en OCMW nemen daar, daar deel aan. Er is een engagementsverklaring met die uh, organisaties getekend uh, voor het uh, realiseren van een uh, gedragen visie rond talenbeleid en ook kwaliteitsvolle dienstverlening. En vanuit het uh, beleid gelijke kansen worden proeftuinen opgezet. Uh, de werking van uh, Onderwijscentrum Gent is er ook één van. Uh, voor Gentse onderwijsbeleid is uh, Nederlands is de instructietaal, maar de meertaligheid kan functioneel ingezet worden en als troef uh, benut. En daarom werkt het onderwijs op verschillende en aangepaste manieren aan vlotte taalverwerving met formele en uh, informele kansen. Onderwijscentrum Gent ondersteunt stedelijke onderwijsbeleid. Uh, en uh, het missie van Onderwijscentrum Gent is ondersteunen, verbieden, verbinden en inspireren van kinderen en jongeren, ouders, onderwijsprofessionals en hun partners, zodat kinderen en jongeren maximale ontplooiingskansen krijgen. Uh, voor Onderwijscentrum Gent is de diversiteit en een meerwaarde en een troef die uitgespeeld moeten worden. En uh, we willen uh, het onderwijsbeleid scholen, leerkrachten en indirect ook leerlingen versterken in het waarderen van uh, omgaan met en benutten van diversiteit. Meertaligheid past binnen het brede kader van diversiteit en we willen vooral een uh, positief verhaal brengen en inzetten op meertaligheid als troef, talensensibilisering en functioneel meertalig leren. En we richten op, uh, ons op, op al wie professioneel in contact komt met meertalige kinderen en hun ouders. Uh, Stad Gent heeft die visie niet zomaar uh, ontwikkeld. Het is gebaseerd op wetenschappelijk onderbouwd visie uh, via, van, uh, via het Gentse thuistaalproject, ook validief project die uh, gelopen is, maar ook internationale uh, onderzoeken. Uh. 
Uh, ook het kinderrechtencommissariaat doet aanbevelingen voor het taalbeleid van scholen. Uh, het beleid vooral een positieve en respectvolle houding tegenover de, thuistaal van, uh, de thuiscultuur en de thuistaal van alle leerlingen. Uh, krachtige leeromgeving uh, uh, en uh, principes taalontwikkelend lesgeven is ons kader. Uh, we ondersteunen en versterken de schoolteams en de leerkrachten voor het uh, opzetten van een open talenbeleid. Open talenbeleid uh, is je school openstellen voor alle talen die leerlingen en hun ouders spreken. We gaan samen met de leerkrachten of het schoolteam kijken welke rol de thuistaal uh, binnen elk van de drie cirkels van een uh, krachtige leeromgeving uh, kan betekenen. Uh, je kan de thuistaal in verschillende gradaties uh, inzetten op je school. Je kan het verbieden en kiezen voor een eentalig model. Uh, je kan tolereren, bijvoorbeeld op de speelplaats, en dan verder niets mee doen. Je kan ook verkennen uh, het waarderen van het gebruik en al talen sensibiliserend zichtbaar maken in de, in de school. Maar je kan het ook echt benutten uh, en het gebruik daarvan stimuleren uh, als hefboom tot leren. Met andere woorden, functioneel meertalig leren. Ik moet het heel snel doen. Uh, welke acties ondernemen wij om die visie uh, van uh, stedelijk beleid te realiseren vanuit Onderwijscentrum Gent? We hebben vormingen en workshops uh, voor uh, leerkrachten, schoolteams, maar ook organisaties relevant aan onderwijs. Uh, we hebben een collegagroep meertaligheid voor leerkrachten en pedagogische begeleiders uh, van basisonderwijs. We hebben verschillende uh, folders met tips voor schoolteams, leerkrachten, uh, ouders, begeleiders, vrije tijdsbesteding of uh, voorlezers aan meertalige kinderen. Uh, we werken actief samen met de pedagogische begeleidingsdiensten uh, via een netwerk intervisiegroep Meertaligheid. We hebben het boek Meertaligheid, een troef die alle ervaringen uh, bundelt van het thuistaalproject en gekoppeld aan een uh, wetenschappelijk onderbouwd achtergrond. We hebben een website meertaligheid.be. Uh, destijds heeft Steunpunt Diversiteit en Leren heeft die website ontwikkeld. En uh, vorig jaar heeft het Onderwijscentrum Gent in samenwerking met verschillende partners uh, het uh, vernieuwd. Uh, over functioneel meertalig leren zal ik het niet veel zeggen, uh, maar we hebben uh, uh, vorig schooljaar een project gelopen. Ik heb het ook bij de inleiding van die film al gezegd. Uh, we hebben een tool ontwikkeld dat de leerkrachten of schoolteams uh, als handleiding kunnen gebruiken uh, als ze thuistaal een plaats willen geven in een school. We zetten projecten of ondersteunen de schoolteams in het realiseren van conversatietafels voor ouders die laagtaalvaardig zijn in het Nederlands, om uh, zo oefenkansen Nederlands te bieden en op die manier ook bij de school te uh, betrekken. Uh, dit uh, zowel in het basisonderwijs als uh, secundair onderwijs. Ook voor conversatietafels hebben wij... Uh, Eind van vorig schooljaar een toolkit conversatietafels in secundair onderwijs uh, ontwikkeld en die vind je ook op de website van Meertaligheid. Uh, we zetten uh, projecten en ondersteunen schoolteams in het werken met uh, anderstalige nieuwkomers, zowel uh, voor basisonderwijs uh, als secundair onderwijs. Uh, onthaalklassen voor anderstalige nieuwkomers, maar ook de uh, taalcoaches. Uh, in de vervolgscholen waar die kinderen er naartoe gaan. Uh, momenteel loopt het project Transfer. Het doel van het uh, Transferproject is uh, via een netwerk samenwerken aan een geslaagde onderwijsloopbaan uh, voor uh, derde landers. En tenslotte uh, ondersteunen wij ook de acties die ondernomen zijn, uh, uh, acties die ondernomen zijn uh, door uh, schoolteams, uh, door interne werking uh, van brugfiguren en brede schoolwerking en ook organisaties rond taalstimulering aan, uh, in de thuiscontext. Voilà. I think that this uh, question is going to sound, or this statement is going to sound very familiar, namely that quality education can only be reached when policy, research, and practitioners work together. With regards to multilingualism, this collaboration lacks today. How do you feel about that, Minister Gertz? I'm afraid that is correct, but we can always bridge the gap, so that's why we're here. Uh, and that's also what we are going to try to do in Brussels, because I didn't explain uh, yet what multilingualism or the policy on it will will become or should become in, in, in Brussels. 
we we had a, a, a long uh, problem with languages uh, in in Brussels with a mini Belgium. Eh? But for the last 10, 15 years, uh, demography, demography and the different uh, people in different citizens in, in, in the city, uh, European and international, have changed the character of this tension. Yeah? There is, uh, people are more relaxed with uh, talking different languages, which is a good thing, uh, with translanguaging also. And so the, the, the challenge that we are facing now is to bring this knowledge that is certainly there, because what I've heard from Ghent, we're doing it in Brussels for, for a longer time, but only in our uh, Flemish cocoon, in our Flemish schools cocoon, eh? which is a good thing because it's ap appreciated by Brussels, but it's time to, to, to share the knowledge with, with uh, other people. So uh, within two, three weeks, uh, there will be a policy note uh, in Parliament uh, on my behalf. And as the only minister, I have to, I've asked expressively, ex explicitly for a debate on this policy note because these policy notes, they accompany the budget and you can always, as a member of parliament, ask questions on it. But in Brussels, you have to ask, I want to have a debate on this. And why do we have to have this debate? Because um, it is good to um, tackle or approach multilingualism from a Flemish perspective in Belgium and in Brussels, or a Dutch-speaking perspective in, in Brussels, whatever. Um, but it's also important to know how the French speakers um, approach this um, this uh, issue. It's not the same, and we ha we have to be aware of it because we, if we don't, we get a lot of uh, other discussions that uh, are, are troubling uh, the, the the dialogue. So I, I, at first, I was really pleased with the fact that in the negotiations for the Brussels uh, policy uh, governmental declaration this summer there was this was really uh, apart from really the regionalization of uh, education this is reminds a little bit too tricky for some uh, coalition partners also in brussels but apart from this there was a big uh, support to create this uh, multi multilingualism uh, policy and so that's a good thing that is new I'm, I'm now for almost 30 years in brussels politics and I tell you, 30, 20 years ago, you, you, this, it wouldn't have come to my idea. <laughs> I must admit that. And if it would have have had, uh, there, was, there would have been no support at all. And now people are ready for this. So what we have to do now is to uh, have a debate uh, in Parliament. Parliament is not a copy-paste of society, as we know, but we have to have a debate in Parliament because I want to, to feel the kind of support, the kind of misunderstandings, the kind of other arguments that can be uh, exchanged. And we also want to have a debate, and now and then I, I'm closing uh, my intervention because I come back to the to, to what is on the screen. We also want to uh, put around the table a coalition of the willing, also a coalition of the knowing. Eh? Uh, and the willing and the knowing are coming together now, so that's a good thing. So we are going to create, uh, also with uh, VIB, ULB, uh, other partners too, Onderwijs eh? Centrum Brussel, Point de Langue, um, this um, this round table where we say, okay, how, go, how are we going to structure this policy? Because I will be in a hurry to um, implement this uh, multilingualism policy, but I will also take my time because it's something very new. There is a white page. I can, uh, with other partners, write everything I want on, on it. But we have to write the right. The, we have to write the, the, the right story. Huh? Well, um, again, we, we have to make the right plan. And so that is what we are going to try, not also in education, but also in other sectors in, in, in Brussels now. And I want to create a point of no return in policy, but also mentally in, in, in the heads of politicians and citizens within three years from now. Okay. I hear a coalition of the knowing and a coalition of the willing. It sounds like a new Western movie in my head. Um, but Professor Van Avermaet, um, you're on the, other, on, on the other side of the table. Um, how do you feel that politicians or policymakers approach you and do you feel it's, it's enough, enough? And do you feel that you have enough uh, opportunities to share your knowledge and translate it into policy? And if not... Do, do you feel enough love? <laughs> Professor. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's not that kind of app. <laughs> <clears throat> um, well, uh, 
this is this is all no, that, 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 that's fine um, no I, I I felt tempted to say um, well sometimes I have the experience that that they not always listen but I I, I don't think people and and politicians always have to listen to 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 academics I mean um, we, we, we 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 do research and 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 we we, we come up with certain evidence and 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 but at the same time we always have to be humble in our in in our findings um, but at the same time what I think is important is that uh, we as academics and that was the point I wanted to make as well that um, my 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 invite to to all of you to take up that advocacy role and I think this is very important that we as academics also take up that uh, that advocacy role so we have to create these opportunities um, for interacting and, uh, and and communication and sometimes it depends on on, on coincidences um, and and we always have to be aware as academics um, I mean there is no absolute truth in the, the things we are working on but we and and we carefully have to think on how we frame things and how we reframe things just to give one example the first study we did in 2008 with, which was uh, here in the city of Ghent the Teustal project which was commissioned by the, um, the, the, the the city of Ghent and I still remember uh, after a longitudinal uh, uh, study of, um, of um, almost five years um, we came up with the results and one of the results was that we didn't found any positive effect on the acquisition of uh, Dutch as a second language by doing this experiment. The first reaction of the alderman was not the picture, it was the previous alderman, the alderman of education. Oh, how on earth we invested so much money, five year study, and we didn't find a, we, we didn't find a, a positive uh, effect. And this realized me that we as researchers always have to be careful in the way we frame it. We, we immediately reframed our communication and we said, look, what is the assumption, what is the deeply rooted assumption that exploiting the multilingual repertoires of children will have a negative effect on their L2 learning? The fact that we didn't found an effect was in this case something positive because we didn't found that negative effect. So that's also our role that we have to play in framing and reframing our findings and uh, in, in uh, interacting with, um, with, with politicians, with policy makers. But, um, the minister rightly said, and I fully agree with that, that it, I do think that I'm strongly convinced that it is at the locality, at the level of the localities that we, that we can make uh, the difference because there the multilingual realities are being ex uh, uh, experienced by everybody. There you see a lot of commitment, a lot of feeling uh, of belonging by people living in the cities um, more than at the subnational of national level. So it is at the level of the locality I think that we have to do it. But besides the political and policy level, I think we as academics also have to work, um, as Kathleen says, we have to work with the schools. We have to take into account their, uh, their, their, their feelings of concern, the fact that they don't feel um, confident in what they do, and we have to start from there and work with them. Okay, so that's a very interesting uh, view, and a lot of things can, uh, can be done with that. But Kathleen, how does uh, it work in Australia and in South Africa? How do uh, academia, work field, and policy makers work together there? What I will um, talk about is where things work well. And, um, well, very briefly, with the changeover from the apartheid regime to the post-apartheid South Africa, it was an NGO that actually brought about a change in language policy that got enshrined in the Constitution. So it was a very small little NGO with a couple of people involved in this. And what happened was we started a little um, information um, brochure, then it turned into um, a little newsletter that we sent out four times a year, and we started several years before the transition. So I think that it was probably, we were working at this for about seven years. And by the time the negotiations came for the constitution, um, every single political party wanted to get advice from an NGO about what the new language education policy can be. So you can start from the bottom and work up. Another example from Africa is that in Uganda, in the northwest corner of Uganda where I'm working, there's a small NGO. It started as um, a literacy and basic adult education program. The, the focus was on women 
literacy for women and then also for girls. And it was a small NGO set up by a few students who had left um, the University of Makira University. They had graduated. They felt very concerned about um, women and children's um, education. They started an NGO. And they were the first NGO to be prepared to go and work in the northwest corner after 30 years of conflict. And the last sort of range of, um, you will have heard of this horrible person, um, the, the um, Joseph Coney and the Lord's Resistance Army. So the kids had been out of school for 30 years. This little NGO went back into the communities and got children back into schools and started helping the government in Kampala to get kids back into schools and to actually implement a language policy in which the home languages, a multilingual policy, in fact, was put in place. And the government in Kampala couldn't actually do it. It was the little NGO that managed to do it and to then in get involved in building capacity for the local district educational officials. So you can work from the bottom up. You don't have to work from the top down. The critical thing was, though, that the little organization was so clever at always informing all of the stakeholders, getting the stakeholders to, to get on board. And to, together, they managed to build an ecology whereby everybody was working together. Radio stations were involved. Little local language groups were involved. Little micro industries were involved in printing stories in local languages. And eventually, the government in Kampala said, well, maybe we could together with you develop a teacher's guide for how to implement our language policy. So you can actually have this, and it doesn't have to be top-down. It's actually much better if it's a sort of a collaborative, multi-stakeholder process. So it's everybody involved. And these things are very often the ecologies that can start in the on the ground level. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, I actually think that this, it, it almost seems as if it's planned because um, the next statement is on how schools and the local neighborhood, the local community, um, should work together on uh, multilingualism and language development. Um, but I'm not sure if there's first a new video or an introduction by ISA as, uh, as well. <laughs> Zaba. Heel goed zei dat is precies twee keer hetzelfde. Java en Zaba. Is bij jou ook Java? Nee. Nee, wat zeggen jullie? Turks. Ja, jullie spreken Turks. En wat woord je doet? Kurba. Kurba. Heel goed. Kurba. Mijn mama heeft het Kurba. Jouw mama wist het ook. En Sarah. Ik weet het niet meer. Weet het niet meer? Kijk eens naar de lettertjes van Sarah. Het zijn de lettertjes die wij schrijven in de klas. En de mama's van... Ja, die is van jou, hè. De mama's die het Turkse woordje geschreven hebben, die schrijven ook die lettertjes. En de papa van Stevie heeft ook die lettertjes gebruikt. De mama van Sarah gebruikt die ook zo lettertjes? Oh nee. Dat zijn andere letters, hè? dat zijn Arabische tekens. Moet ik het nog een keer zeggen? Arabisch. Ik kan Arabisch lezen, nog kijk. Divda. 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 Dat klinkt ook een beetje anders. Met hele lange poten, die is aan het springen. Zo groot springen. Het is vooral om de, de betrokkenheid van de kinderen, uh, het respect voor hun thuistaal. Ze genieten daar ook enorm van, uh, dat dat iets is van uh, hen. Uh, Zeer goed, welk hoofdje zeg je in het stof? Uh, Jabba. Ze weten, het woord kikker wordt dan ook enorm veel vernoemd. En dan blijft dat ook hangen. Ik dacht, dus jij zegt... 
Kuba. Kuba in de klasse hebben we kikker. kikker. En heb je er nog één onthouden? Dat zou kunnen. Vraag. De vraag, heel goed. Wow, kijk, Suleiman spreekt al Engels. Een grenoei. 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 Die grenoei. Ja, maar Stevie zijn papa die komt niet uit Frankrijk, die komt uit Afrika. En daar spreken ze Afrikaans. En ze vinden dat ook gewoon leuk om, om die verschillende woorden te horen. Er uh, uh, zijn ook momenten van. Ah, ah, Sarah of Didi. Ah, kan je een keer zeggen naar mama en papa over welk dienst dat we leren in de klas? Over kikker. Over een kikker, hè? Kikker. Hey? Mama, mag ik een keer het woordje kikker opschrijven? Uh, maar ik moet wel nog altijd mama zelf aanspreken. Dus ik vraag, uh, ik zie mama van, omdat ik weet, oh, ja, die spreekt die taal, die heb ik nog niet. En dan vraag ik van, ik heb het ah, En ze zien ah, hier de klap en dat ik niet zo Dus dan weet ze, ah, ja. Ja. En dan ja. opschrijven. Kurba. Kurba. Ja. Een beetje, beetje rechter. Kurba. Dank u wel. En Stevie, wie heet er? Wat? Ik pak wat? Kom maar eens, papa. Ik kan rennen. We zijn over het woordje kikker aan het leren in de klas. En dan vragen we aan de mama's en de papa's om kikker te zeggen in hun taal. Ik spreek niet. Of was het? Ik spreek niet. Of was het? Oui. En zo weten zij ook waarover dat we leren in de klas. Hè. Um, dus, maar ze kennen het principe, maar ik moet ze wel nog zelf aanspreken. Ik zal dat ook doen. Mag je kiezen? Mag je kiezen, ja. Is ook leuk, zo hetzelfde, hè? Het is poos. Ja, ik denk dat is op elkaar, hè? Maar bij ons is zo. Een vogeltje erop. Ja. En is het ook Zaba? Jabba. Ja. Denk niet de drempel om uh, in de klas te komen, maar wel de vrees. Je vraagt me iets en ik ga het niet verstaan. Uh, en daar hebben ze hulp bij nodig van. Kan je een keer mee komen om mij daarin te ondersteunen? Ja, Turks Alle twee ook. Ja. En jij zegt ook Jabba. Mama, in het Bulgaars of in het Turks? Nee, maar weet jij, ken je het woordje kikker in het Bulgaars? Normaal gezien ja, weet ik aan welke mama's ik dat vraag. Kikker, vraag ik dat ook aan dezelfde mama's nu voor die activiteit. Dat ik alle mama's uitgenodigd. En dat is de eerste keer dat ik ook geconfronteerd werd met. Maar mijn mama kan niet lezen en schrijven. Dus. Bulgaar, Jabba. Jabba. Kurba ja. en Jabba. Maar dan ga je het ja. niet houden. Klasje zeggen wij kikker, hè? Kikker. Kikker. Collaboration between schools and other partners. Um, Minister Gatz, I know in Brussels there are a lot of wonderful things going on between BX Brussels, for example, and schools. Maybe you can elaborate a bit on, on that. Well, yes, first I, I want to, to state that if you see this little movie, eh, how can somebody be afraid of, of that? Eh? That is hard to explain. Eh? Well, this being said, um, the language policy of the multilingualism policy that we are going to, tr to try to develop will be uh, broader than just the education system, even if the heart of it is will still be in the education system but also with uh, professional education, uh, beroepsopleiding, with um, learning uh, by doing, uh, werken op de, of taal leren op de vloer, and also the uh, integration trajectories, the inburgeringstrijd, I always say the Dutch, ter, uh, Dutch uh, term because I don't know if my translation is, is, is good enough, and also culture, uh, because we see that in the um, Brussels cultural life, um, um, when you go to uh, to watch a play, uh, there is also that if the play is in Dutch, you can see the translation immediately in uh, French and in English, and, and vice versa, more and more in, in more space. So we, we want to try to develop this um, element as um, 
as an as an evidence, uh, as, or something evident. Evidence is another word, I think, but uh, it's a bit tricky. Um, and this this will take some time, but uh, I think that the stakeholders um, surrounding the, the schools or the school system or the education system are um, willing to to participate in this, um, and and this should um, just bring us to to. Uh, what I want to be Brussels, the most multilingual city in the world. Well, just is just a marketing uh, trick, of course. Eh? But um, I think it's we, we can get there, and I think it's it it, it should be the the truth. Eh? Um, so yes, uh, the opening to other partners is is very important eh? because we don't have to. We're not. We don't want to uh, close um, the debate, which is very interesting just between in between the walls of, of a school it's very important because this is the heart of the debate but the, the society is always as also to to uh, f have the feeling that it's part of a, of a larger uh, uh, project and, and I, I i will end my uh, intervention on this we do of course this we, we we're going to develop this multilingualism uh, policy for an economical reason uh, because the, the brussels labor market needs trilingual persons and also persons who speak another mother tongue. So we don't want to just say Dutch, uh, French, English. This is very important, but also the mother tongue will, will be very important. But we also do it for a, a reason of social cohesion and identity. We think if, if language has divided our city for decades, now uh, the, the city, these languages can also create a, a bridge between, not between communities, but just between people. And, and that's the double objective that we will always keep in mind. The economical is there. It's, it's easier for me to develop this identity element because I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm supported by the economical element, but the identity element of what is a, a Brusseler of today, someone speaking different languages, is very important to create this, uh, this automatic uh, link between both. OK, thank you. Um, I'm now going to. Go, I'm going to freestyle for a moment. Um, if, if, I, if I may, I'm a bit, a bit rude, but I really have to, to, to go and, and yes, back to okay Brussels. For a, yeah. uh, so unfortunately, for questions or for other things, uh, I, I cannot uh, go into that now. But the policy note will, of course, be available within two, three weeks in Dutch, in French and in English. And I'm happy to have uh, other personal contacts with you in the, the, the weeks and the months to come. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for being here. As I said, I was planning on freestyling a bit here because I know that we've got a panel here, but I would like to know from you, what are you doing as a school, as a teacher training to collaborate with other partners? Do you've got inspirational stories here that you can share with us as well? Or not? It's the risk of freestyling, of course. Yeah, I teach um, little children of three years old, so um, in Brussels. So that means I have no children that are Flemish speaking. Um, and my question at the moment, my most important question at the moment is, um, I work at a school that we are already working hard at language and language skills. And we are um, at the point that we know the um, uh, mother tongue is very important and we are now questioning the parents about their mother tongue and what they think about it and we find um, we yeah we found that at the moment there are surprisingly a lot of people that if you ask what is your mother tongue that they d do not even know how to answer that question. They cannot say, we speak to our children in that or that or that language. They say, we speak and that language and that language and that language and that language. And they, do, they have no idea anymore what to do with that. And we neither. <laughs> I'm also from Brussels, from Saint-Jules. 
think it's the most diverse district of Belgium. <laughs> but it's it's true, we don't speak about uh, mother tongue anymore, we speak about home languages, because uh, the most of the, of the of the children, they have, the mother is from Polish origin and the father from Turkish origin. So we have this multilingual in the families already. And on top of that, we have the schools, we have Flemish and French schools. So we have French is the spoken language in Brussels. Then they ha so you have the spoken language of the street, you have the language of home, and then you have the school's language. So it's 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 an in, in quadrat. <laughs> so I would like to have your advice on that. Um, <clears throat> this is not an unusual phenomenon in urban settings anywhere in the world. So in Africa, um, people talk about multilingualism as the lingua franca. So the lingua franca is not a single language. Um, in Africa, people use multilingualism as the lingua franca, which means that there are places in very remote villages where people have a mother tongue, but nowadays it's almost impossible to identify. The mother tongue doesn't mean a single language. The mother tongue can be a mix of languages. It can be multilingualism. So in other words, the mother tongue is actually a metaphor for the language practices that the people in a particular community or family use. So the way that we understand languages as formal written languages like Dutch, it looks very different from French and it looks different from English in a written text, is not how people use languages. So in many countries, well, I mean, in many communities, if you go to remote communities in um in southern Africa, people who speak San and Kwe languages, they, if you ask them what language they speak, they will give you the word for language. They don't have a name for their language. It is just a Kwe name, a Kwe word for language. So it is language. And so people don't think about language in the same way that we have come to see languages as separate. The critical thing is home language, the local language, the language of the immediate community, which probably means multilingualism. So if this means that one's working with multilingualism in early years, it means that the children are going to just bring the words that they know for certain things. And they may not belong to specific, they will not necessarily all come from an identified, identifiable standard language. That's what I can say. But we have to just have a different view of how people use their languages. <laughs> uh, so if the purpose was to get more students to this above this average level to, to, to give them more opportunities for studying later, is the research how, how they construct uh, knowledge in this multilingual lingua franca? Because that's what you would have to know to understand their uh, thinking processes with these multiple languages to be able to help them in the, the, the school language or Dutch or, or not, maybe not, maybe it's a, a wrong question, I don't know. Well, it, it, it's, it's a very interesting question, but the, the, the thing is, although we do a lot of neurolinguistic and IRAM at, at uh, Jill's field, although there is an, a lot of an interesting neurolinguistic research, still there is a lot we don't know what happens in the brain. Um, uh, what, what is for sure is that uh, our brain with regard to languages isn't structured in the sense that we have a, a part of the brain which is Dutch and another part which is in, so, so it's, it's, it's mar, far more complex and far more dynamic and uh, so um, how it works um, is, is still hard to, 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 to uh, answer the question and what you see is that it, it differs across time um, um, when, when children are at the age of three it can be it's not by definition but that can be that one repertoire is more dominant than other repertoires in uh, in the process of socialization but at a certain uh, period in time uh, due to, to schooling uh, another repertoire becomes more dominant and that might have an impact uh, on 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 uh, constructing uh, knowledge um, what 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 we what we do know is that um, if we provide maximum opportunities in from a didactic perspective in an educational setting, if we provide maximum opportunities for children to exploit 
all their repertoires uh, in order to, to, to construct the knowledge they have to construct. And that's the most important uh, thing. So it's, it, for me, the, the answer not just lies in what's going on here, but what, 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 what are the didactic conditions in order to allow uh, children to use their repertoires as an, as an asset for, for, for learning. Okay, um, I think we can come to the conclusion that we did not answer the statement, um, or at least not discuss the statement, um, but that's okay, because the idea was to interact with the audience, the idea was um, to, to make sure that questions are answered, and I'm well aware that the number of questions that have been asked and answered um, are very limited, but luckily there is still the lunch break, so I uh, think we first see the Feel good movie, or no? Okay. Okay. So there is a little feel good movie that is not going to be shown here again for lunch reasons. Um, <laughs> There's too much food in it. There is. Oh yeah, we need food. Um, but please do not hesitate to contact everyone with your questions. And I think that the app is still working as well. I have to leave because I have to teach in a couple of hours and I need to get back to Brussels. Uh, but I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And I also want to thank. Uh, Kathleen and uh, Pete for being here. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> that happens with teachers. Thank you very much for being here. <laughs>